Okay, well, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Gosh, with that introduction, uh, most of my thunder has already been stolen, but uh, I'll go ahead. This is a program that I initially put together for the Terminal Lakes Conference um, for part of the slides here, and then the other part of the slides um, are what we use in riparian proper functioning condition assessment training courses um, often around the state of Nevada and uh, sometimes in California and elsewhere. Um, the emphasis is on water quality. And uh, I'm finding water quality, I believe, the way the Clean Water Act does as a combination of chemistry and physical habitat as well as biology. And uh, so sort of a robust uh, view of water quality uh, with the idea of fishable, swimmable waters, the things that we all care about. Um, I want to the concept of floods and uh, recognize that floods happen are a when, not an if, event. Um, when they happen, we tend to get exponential increased sediment. You see a sediment rating curve down there. Uh, it's a some generic one. Um, each watershed will have its own sediment rating curve, but one of the central tenets of these is that the amount of sediment increases exponentially as the discharge increases. With that extra sediment, work is done. Uh, we have channel erosion. Uh, we all have sediment deposition, so the sediment de deposits can lead to channel repair. Uh, but whenever sediment comes into the channel, it tends to bring nutrients with it. Soil is a great nutrient storage vessel, and suspended sediment in water is one of our major pollutants. Uh, because of nutrients that, that are um, in the water, uh, we have opportunity for eutrophication, which is generally considered a, a bad thing. Um, have opportunities within that riparian and aquatic ecosystem for nutrient uptake, for assimilation of the pollutants, and uh, some of that involves floodplain access and the riparian vegetation on the floodplain, um, and some of it are going on within the aquatic system, assuming that we have aquatic biota to do that, that work. Saturated uh, soil, we get the opportunity for denitrification, and that is another aspect of the water quality. Uh, remediation. So if floods happen, then the question is what happens in floods? And the answer is that it depends really on the functions of the riparian area. Um, and also between floods, what happens depends on the functions of the riparian area. So it's those functions that I want to focus on today in this talk. This slide of the non-point source stressors from 2009 across the nation uh, lists a number of things that uh, are stressing our aquatic ecosystems related to water quality. Those have some influence by the functions of the riparian ecosystem are starred. And you see that it is most of them. So many mechanisms involved connecting functionality to water quality. And I'll talk about uh, some of them today. I won't really dwell on all of them. Let's start with the definition of proper functioning condition. Riparian ways are functioning properly when adequate vegetation, landform, or large woody debris is present to do some things, to do, to do, to dissipate stream energy, the energy associated with high flows, uh, 25, maybe even 30-year events. I've seen some property functioning riparian areas go through dam break events and uh, continue to function. But generally, it's the 25-year event that we find that uh, if it is functioning properly, it will withstand that kind of force. Um, with in landform and large debris present, we can filter sediment and filter bed load, allowing systems to stay stable in form as they are dynamic, um, moving into the valley, swinging and sweeping. Aid floodplain development, flood are critically and improve flood groundwater recharge. Doing that, we stabilize stream banks. Stream banks are stable stream banks are necessary to do the above. And with these things, we get habitat for fish and wildlife. We get improved quality, improved production, decoil erosion, better diversity, and ecosystem services. So the idea is that Adequate vegetation, 
landform or large woody material does the things on the left and provides the things on the right. right. All care about. Think that we're really in the water quality business in order to provide. Some are functional at risk. There is a soil, water, or vegetation attribute that makes them susceptible to degradation. And the degradation in functionality can be tremendously important. So clearly not providing the vegetation, landform, or large woody debris to do the work, to dissipate the stream energies, to filter the sediment and capture bed load, to aid in floodplain development, to improve floodwater retention and groundwater recharge, or to stabilize stream banks. And therefore, not providing wildlife habitat, at least not for the species that are of conservation interest. They do not improve water quality. In fact, they tend to degrade water quality. They do not improve forage production. We increase soil erosion. That's a big part of the water quality problem, but certainly not all of it. And increased biodiversity. We do not be down in the red zone where we start over at bare ground each time we have a major flood event. Instead, want to be over on the green side of the diagram where we have decision space, where we choose which of the values, which of the land uses we want to emphasize. We can use the desired conditions that we want to manage for, and in order to do that, we have to have properly functioning conditions, streams, and riparian areas, or lick riparian areas. That proper condition, therefore, provides the foundation for all of the things that we might want to emphasize in our management. Riparian area depends on a three-legged stool. If uh, you're sitting on a three-legged milking stool, if you lose any one leg, you find yourself sitting on the floor. And we don't want to lose these legs, and yet we find that they're very interdependent. The vegetation that grows in riparian areas depends on water and on the soil, on the nutrients stored in the soil, and on the ability of, of the riparian landform to spread the water out so that it can go into the ground, so that it can be there in the sponge to provide the water for the vegetation, water and nutrients. Soil carries much of the um, material for the valley bottom. Uh, in the process of erosion upstream and deposition downstream, it was in by flowing water, and it can be washed away by flowing water. But in the meantime, uh, its form and its uh, uh, solidity held together by vegetation and by the energy dissipating capacity of the floodplain and landform, if that is the place in the watershed where the solid is located, where there is a floodplain, so parts of the water have much in the way of floodplains naturally, but those who do tend to be particularly dependent on that floodplain and therefore on the vegetation that stabilizes the stream banks against the, the flowing water. Water forms the landscape and water can, can exert tremendous uh, forces to uh, damage that water and watershed floodplain and riparian system. In order to conduct a riparian proper functioning condition assessment, we see the idea of potential. What would an area be like if we move all of the human influences and uh, we do it on a reach basis? We divide a wide into parts. The parts along the riparian area are called reaches and they are geomorphically similar in their potential, have the same general potential to produce riparian community types, even if those community types might move around following meanders as they move across, for, for instance. And we consider the attributes and processes using interdisciplinary team. When I was first asked to review the riparian PFC approach, I expected not to like it because I expected there to be magic numbers. I didn't find magic numbers, and the way that we get around having magic numbers that presume to reflect goodness is by an interdisciplinary team that understands the soils and geomorphology of each of these reaches, that understands the plants and their flooding or ability to tolerate flooding,
as well as their physical characteristics to influence the stability of the system. A hydrologist to understand what kinds of water flows we would typically get on what kind of frequency and when we would get them. Fish and wildlife biologist that understands which vertebrates particularly are um, going to find habitat in that kind of a locality so that we can use their presence or absence as an indication of the habitat quality. And the landowner or permittee, the people who have been in place a long time, sometimes multiple generations, and the people who are going to use this knowledge, putting it to work for management of the riparian area. These reaches or areas has attributes and processes that drive it. Some of the attributes and processes are hydrogeomorphic, and there's a list there. We could go through that list with uh, some detail, allow you to think about each of those and how they reflect to the structure and function of the riparian areas that you're familiar with. Uh, I don't have time for that today. Um, so move on to another attributes and process list, and this one is for vegetation. And we find that in different places we have different potential to grow different community ty types, and each of the community types has certain structural and sessional dynamics and characteristics going on. And that, that uh, time is very important, then that has adapted to riparian conditions, has adapted a lot of ability to withstand those forces. When we get to erosion and deposition, that is the essential uh, structure building process for riparian systems. Uh, bank stability is very important in order to maintain channel form and flood access. Uh, bed stability is also important to maintain the floodplain access, and as we'll see, that is critical. In the mean depositional features, help explain to the geomorphologist what is going on and whether the processes are accelerated or at a normal rate for the particular area. Soils have attributes and processes related to their ability to soak up the water, provide it to plants, and also in relation to their erodibility and their fertility. So all those influence water quality the temperature, salinity, nutrients, dissolved oxygen, and sediment that would occur in places. So with those attributes and processes, with the complexity of all of those, mind when we get to a particular place, we need all of the disciplines to help us understand what is going on, what is the nature of this place, what would happen in this place when we get one of those large flows. We see that this is a meandering stream, it's got a low width depth ratio, and we see that it's got stabilizing vegetation on the banks. We had graduate students measuring the <coughs> excuse me, root and rhizomes of these plant communities. We found over a mile of roots and rhizomes in a four inch cube. Great stability for the banks. When we put them in a flume and ran water past them to measure soil erosion, they did not erode. That allows these banks to be stable, which allows the form of the stream to gradually decrease its width depth ratio to the point where it is here. And with arrow width depth ratio, we have a potential for high sinuosity. That high sinuosity acts somewhat like switchbacks on the mountain road. It reduces the slope of the stream, the gradient, and therefore the amount of force that that stream exerts against the bank. And that combination provides the stability and form that allows the stream to change only very slowly through time, which is why we have a low width ratio and a high sinuosity. And together with that, we have the Aquarian floodplain acting as a sponge. The dirty water of the year is going to be when the high flow comes, and that high water is going to spread across a floodplain, allow sediments and the nutrients to go onto the floodplain instead of being in the channel. The water is stored in the aquifer can supply the vegetation, the water-loving plants that have the tremendous root systems can get the water they need throughout the year to provide the strength and stability they need for the system. If stream were put in cross-section, 
comes from originally from Sherm Jensen, and adopted and used widely by the National Riparian Service Team, show that stream and cross-section more or less near the top. Um, and that stream could be stressed in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes the stresses are associated with more, more urban or agricultural settings, sometimes more rural agricultural range management or other forms of wildland management. So stress a stream in B by putting in too much sediment, too much water, not enough water, not enough sediment, uh, too much sampling damage, weakening the plants with grazing, or uh, weakening streams with uh, too much fish, fisherman access and trampling, recreation trampling, um, sediment from a watershed problem is away. Uh, what we do to stress the system is it at risk. And, and if this exceed the ability of the natural resilience of the system and accumulate the point where we, we get graded stress and, and incision, and we lose the floodplain access that is so critical to the vegetation as well as to the rest of the functions. With channel incision, we get the flood flows in a pipe-like flow, not just base flows as we have in A, but the flood flows in C in that low width depth ratio channel. And the low width depth ratio flood channel leads to tremendous velocities those velocities in a very weakened stream bank uh, can, uh, stream channel with weakened stream banks, uh, low density root systems in a sagebrush meadow lead to accelerated erosion. And during this process, we're mining the soil that we've been accumulating through millennia, sending that soil downstream where it is a pollutant, as a um, physical habitat problem, and draining the water table. The blue line has sunk in the two middle diagrams, C and D. And we have the dry vegetation. We've lost the habit values of the riparian area as well as the fish values. C and D we would call non-functional. Now, a while, the bad news begins to be a bit of good news because we have enough width in the gully and the incision. We can begin to form a two-stage channel. Computation can come in to occupy the sediments that are deposited. And if that colonizing vegetation, we can collect some finer sediments. The sediments provide the habitat for some stabilizing vegetation, and eventually we can get the kinds of stabilizing vegetation that we need for that channel to begin to form meanders again, and with meanders, pools, and habitat quality for fish. We have a bit of a floodplain access, and so we have some aquifer recharge going on, we have some better things happening to the water table um, along the stream and back to what we would call proper functioning condition because we have the physical foundation to meet the de definition. Now, have we retained all of the benefits that we had up in A? No, it's very important to keep that floodplain access in the first place, and we've lost much of that by the time we get to F. But we have enough resilience now in the vegetation that we can maintain the stream channel form and the attributes and processes, at least most of them, needed for that system to function properly. This stream is like being at the water park on the very steep slide, and you're now far enough down from the top of the slide that you cannot go back. You've crossed the geomorphic threshold, and it is a very fast ride down to the bottom. As energy accumulated in this channel after it has begun to incise, eats at the bed, the incision gets deeper, and the process leads to more and more soil erosion as the banks cave in and throw it away. Here that process presumably happened many decades ago, and we can we are beginning to form some causing vegetation along the margins. In some place that colonizing vegetation is going through plant succession and converting to stabilizing vegetation. If you know the background, there's a kind of a light brown uh, blob. Blob is actually a stone house. Went over to that stone house and it has no roof. The people who built that house and intended to live there lost their ability to live on the land. 
because the stream lots has lost its ability to function properly and they could not use that stream for irrigation purposes any further. Downstream, where presumably a head cut might have come through sooner, when that the stream has had more time for recovery, the stream has narrowed up with a sedge rush willow community that can provide tremendous bank stability. We are still times going up against the edge of the gully as streams come up against the edge of their valley and sometimes even in pristine conditions have high sediment loads at a spot. This gully is still widening and will have high sediment loads at spots like that. But over most of the stream, we have sinuosity, width depth ratio, floodplain access, and all of the attributes and processes that go along with that. In order to conduct a PFC assessment, we use a checklist. The checklist is broken up into three parts. There's a section of questions on hydrology. And the first question is floodplain of a bank full is in it in relatively frequent events. The the is that we would expect um, um, two or three years or more. And those relatively frequent flood events, the one half year event defined at the bank full, the events bigger than that should be spreading out over a floodplain in those places where we have floodplains. Um, that critical question. Many of our valleys across the West were formed with the action of beavers, and so where we have beaver dams, we want to know if they're active and stable. We all know whether the sinuosity, width, depth ratio, and gradient are in balance with the landscape setting. Lands were landscapes were formed by the action of flowing water. They can be stable against the actions, but if they lose that form, they no longer be, be stable. And we want to know whether they have the form that is appropriate or where they are or not. The river area is widening or it has achieved potential uh, can be a yes if you either are widening or if you are at potential. The width of the rain area certainly relates to the ability to do, uh, do the, um, the functions that we're talking about, and it is an indication of whether we're on the right road, improving our trend or, or not. Water up the watershed is not contributing to riparian wetland degradation. This question is worded oddly because um, all of the yes answers to recommend or to reflect positive conditions and the no answers to, rec to reflect some issues that we have with the stream. And so this is worded a bit backwards. There's a, a big section of the checklist on vegetation questions. We want to know if the plants that are there are reproducing. Do we have recruitment, maintenance, and recovery, a diverse age class distribution? We want to have the right kinds of plants available for wetland recovery. Um, we see diversity in the various groups that stabilize the, the stream in various kinds of settings. We, the uh, riparian wetland plants are the ones that have the root conditions that are really important and that the plants can also be an indication of the hydrology so we can find out whether the landform and the hydrology is allowing the vegetation to provide the wetland plants that then have the, the root masses capable of withstanding the high stream flow events. We also know if those plants are vigorous so that they can grow um, the root systems they need to grow. Root systems are one of the first things that are reduced when plants become less vigorous. And then if we have the right plants, the right diversity, we want if we have enough of them. Is there an adequate vegetation cover present to protect the banks and dissipate energy during the high flow events? In areas, we need the debris. Forest streams, steep streams, even in the Great Basin, uh, woody plants, trees, and shrubs can provide important structural energy dissipating mechanisms. And so in those streams that require it, we want to know if we have the kind of plant community to provide it. Um, in question 13, the floodplain and channel characteristics, rocks, overflow channels, coarse and or large woody material are adequate to dissipate energy. This really is the nut of the matter, dissipation of energy. Whether point bars are revegetating with riparian wetland vegetation, if they're not, it may be a problem with hydrology, it may be a problem with grazing management, could be other problems, 
but they're a good indication of whether our current management is on track to allow the system to be dynamic and stable through time. Stream movement is associated with natural sinuosity. is a good thing. Streams naturally move, meandering across valleys, and they sweep down valleys. But they need to do that at a rate that allows the point bar side to catch up with the erosion rate on the other side. And if that rate is accelerated by too much sediment or weak vegetation or improper landform, then we have accelerated stream movement. And that can be a real problem, can lead to sinking of channels and lead to incision. And the question is critically important, a question of its own. The system is vertically stable. You have a properly functioning riparian area that is, even if it's at potential in all ways, but it at least is properly functioning, but it is not vertically stable because there's, say, a downstream head cut that automatically puts it at risk. The streams of the water and sediment being supplied by the watershed, excessive erosion or deposition, is another clue to this question of whether the stream is functioning properly. So at the end of the checklist, you go back to the definition. Read the definition over. Think about that definition in relation to this particular reach of the stream. Or if it's a lake area, it's a very similar definition, but the emphasis on energy is on other things such as wave energies and uh, um, and sediment coming in from the uplands. But in any case, you read the definition and think about it in, in relation to the attributes and processes in relation to the checks, the yeses and the noes, and answer the question, is it functioning properly or is it at risk? or is clearly not functional. If it is at risk, it's critically important to know the trend. And so that's the next question that we do. And we can use the attributes and processes to help us focus on trend. I next talk a little bit about land uses. And we could ask the question here of whether this riparian is functioning properly. We we'll go through the checklist to answer that. The flood conditions probably would not be the place to the time um, for optimum check of that checklist because we need to get out there to see the plants and channel forms when they're not underwater. We can see that at least we're flooding a floodplain in this big event. Would we floodplain here in a relatively frequent event? Well, that's going to be an important question. Do the lenses here allow it to function properly is ultimately the question that we want to answer in order to know whether we're on track for water quality or the other things that we care about landscape setting, and you can see that we have a lot of open land. Land is potentially floodable without tremendous human cost, but we see the land, same landscape with much more urban development, and all urban development provides uh, the opportunity for flooders to do damage, provides the excuse for people to then go do damage to the stream taking away functions in the name of flood control, and that is very commonly a problem. So a central question for much of our radiant alluvial valleys is our parent area managed so that rivers can be rivers. Water quality is, is, um, is wonderful, but if we can't even have the river maintaining it as a river, then we got for water quality to matter in. Jeff Mount from U.S. Talk talks about the um, concept of serial engineering and the concept of the flood memory half-life. Soon after we have a flood, we find that it is on people's mind. And as time goes by, that flood is not on people's mind. Most of the development in floodplains happens when it's not on people's mind. They don't remember that it flooded or it's been long enough ago that, that they think must be a relatively low risk. When of these low-gradient low alluvial valleys, we recognize that there are best agricultural soils. They're the places where people wanted to live, where it was productive, and to do floodplain farming. And floods happen. Flood valleys, because that flat surface is probably a floodplain formed by the building of point bars as the meanders swing and sweep across the valley. Um, because the floods are inconvenient, uh, people then may do uh, things like agricultural levees. They may start with snagging the river. Um, but whatever they do, they think they've done some flood control so the water can go away 
way quicker, and they put more infrastructure out on that valley. With infrastructure, there's more opportunity for damage, and eventually it, we may even get floodplain urbanization. But floods are a when, not an if question, and so we get flooding. So there's more incentive to do more things to the river, and so we do flood control. Then people think there's more safety from floods, but there's not enough safety. And in fact, the more flood control we do up in the watershed, the bigger the floods are going to be down in the watershed. And so the process goes around and around and around. So we might ask the question here for Yarrington, this is street as it becomes a floodplain dam and builds floodwaters up into the town. What will we do to the river in order to help water go faster rather than slower? Proper conditions are about keeping water on the land longer, and yet urbanizing floodplains is a incentive for that. We go upstream from there a little bit. We look at an area that is um, earlier in the process of serial engineering. But is there evidence of the process? Yes. And is there, are there places in this valley where people will want to build their homes? Yes. And where they're going to want to build their homes is where it's prettiest. And yet those are the places close to the river where the trees are, where there is the most damage from flooding potential, and where we're, we'll accelerate this process of serial engineering the most. So the question is, what is the future of our rivers? The Los Angeles River at, at Main Street is uh, is love of uh, the Los Angeles River that we've seen in so many movies, of the concrete channel. That's not going to do very, very much for assimilating um, nutrients and other water quality damage. The Rocky River in Sparks has had um, major issues with water quality. We have a tertiary water quality treatment plant that we spend a lot of money on because of uh, water quality issues in the Truckee, endangered species, and so forth. We're now contemplating spending close to a billion dollars to restore floodplain access in um, the Truckee River in Reno. That's a flood control that we think is more functional. Um, but it's going to be an expensive process. Um, the reason we're invested in floods and rivers, of course, is that all flow down downstream, and downstream we may have um, oceans and estuaries, or we may have lakes. And my lake water quality depends ultimately on what happens in the watershed. So process. First look at the existing condition. Think about its potential. UFC to understand what is needed, and then think about what we want. We develop priorities, especially focusing on the areas that are at risk. And those priorities and what we want, we set goals and objectives, achievable and sustainable, measurable and worthy. Those of us in identifying our planned actions would lead us to monitoring and ultimately using that, that monitoring infor information to flexible and modify management as we move forward. Management chain reaction. With flood access and proper use management, we can get to things like a stubble height with vegetation, which leads to colonizers because they're uh, able to grow. And then we get deposition of fine sediments, which leads to a place for stabilizers to grow which leads to narrowing a channel because those stabilizers do that work, which leads to increased floodplain access and aquifer recharge, which leads to improved place flow conditions and improved water quality and habitat, which leads to increased fish populations and increased creation of satisfaction. So those of us in land management would ask, where is the objective? What in this chain reaction would we select out to be a good objective state? And I would contend that the first things, um, especially the, uh, the proper management and the stubble height, would be good things to monitor, but they're actions, not objectives. Things that relate to uh, objectives that would be very measurable uh, and that directly drive the system. The vegetation, uh, vegetation right on the stream channel is an excellent place to monitor because it does the work, leads to the stream narrowing, that ultimately contributes to the functionality, and with functionality, we then get the value. And wondering which objective we would choose for what time frame, we have to think about the process and the recognition that things take time. And so we go forward in time, we can select 
objectives that will take a little bit longer, depending upon our time horizon and the nature of the system that we're working with. We would choose shorter or longer kinds of objectives. Ultimately, we get to the things that we really care about. But before we get there, we can measure the vegetation that drive the process and leads us to the functionality. This is a composite from the life experience of a retired employee, a BLM employee in, in um, Idaho, Irv Cowley. And he recognized that we have a bare ground kind of situation with poor channel condition, riparian condition in general. The thing that we'll get is vegetation. Of course, we may need to have a floodplain before we can even do that. But with vegetation, we begin to capture the sediments, build the channel back, and as the channel builds back, then have the opportunity for the aquifer recharge that leads to the higher quality water, the lower width depth ratio, lower temperatures, those kinds of things. And eventually get to, we get to functionality, and with functionality we eventually get to the uh, resources or the water quality standards that we're interested in. They start taking pictures of Bear Creek back in 77, and I've been taking them every year. I'll show you just the beginning one, uh, called with grazing management issues, long seasons of grazing, June, and especially during the hot season, June, July, and August, even without very many animals, can cause quite a bit of damage, and so that's what it looked like. The air and water temperature, and this is the um, the daily maximum um, and then they found there really wasn't much difference between the two. Um, the water temperature was very closely following the air temperature. But they did the grazing use from summer to early spring, and that was after the snowmelt runoff, and they got long on early enough so that the plants would be able to grow long before the July thunderstorms and allowed the vegetation to be there for the, the other high flow event. And having vegetation in place for both high flow events, they were able to capture sediment and build that vegetation. Um, because they were grazing at a time of the year that met the functions of the streams, they were able to um, uh, get the kind of improvement they wanted with a four times increase in water storage, ten times increase in production, an increase in erosion, and an increase in, in the area of the riparian area. They were able to do that with an increase in forage for livestock um, that they harvest by that improved management. And with all of that result, they found that they had a very substantial difference between the air temperature, the dark blue line, and water temperature, the light blue line, with different, the medium green line showing that we're well above the zero line, um, quite different from what we had to begin with. So the process is assess your streams. If you've got a downward trend and you're at risk, then monitor management. And if you're still not a um, uh, trend, if you're on a downward trend, you need to modify it again. Modify the no's from the checklist because those tell, that tells you what the problem is with your particular area. If on the hand you're on an upward trend, then you want to continue your management strategy. And you eventually begin monitoring not just the things that are required for functionality, but the things that you ultimately want to accomplish, uh, such as uh, improved water quality, fish habitat, et cetera. Um, if you, for once you attain PFC, you would um, continue your strategy. You'd continue monitoring. And if you ever determined that you had a static or downward trend, you'd modify. But if you have a continued upward trend, then you'd continue that management strategy and ultimately obtain your resource management objectives. So focus on the functions first, and ultimately with the functions, you'll get to the things that you really care about for the long term. Riparian for functioning condition does not equal our desired condition. In many cases, our ultimate objective may be higher than just PFC, but getting to PFC provides the foundation that supports getting to things that are our legal requirements. It displaces them. It supports getting to them. It helps with determining the potential and capability. It helps to link the and the watershed processes to the habitat and the water quality conditions. It defines issues to be addressed. It helps select appropriate management practices and to determine the appropriate monitoring. 
the appropriate place to monitor those places that are at risk, and the appropriate things to monitor those no's from the checklist that identify the issues. If any further information about any of this, I'd be happy to chat with you. And my phone number is listed, as well as my um, email address. And the process that I've talked about assessing riparian proper functioning condition has been sorted by the National Riparian Service Team out of Prineville Oregon for uh, a couple of decades. The idea is cooperative riparian restoration. We recognize that we cannot postage stamp the West with um, disclosures to exclude bad management. What we need to do instead is to improve management of whole watersheds. And with it towards functionality, we know what to improve and where to focus our attention. And there's a network of people in all the Western states. Uh, many Western states have teams, such as the one I coordinate in Nevada, an interdisciplinary team that teaches these classes and helps with site-specific problem identification and also collaboration as needed. We found that by using PFC to identify the physical function issues, we can um, a number a diversity of people into a creation because they have a common understanding of the physical basis for the things that they can accomplish in their riparian area for their multiple purposes. Without any questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can unmute your phone. You can also send questions via chat. I see there are some uh, questions. About what I've talked about there. But if questions about functionality and the linkage to water quality, I especially uh, be happy to ask those. Mute off. Rick, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Hey, um, I live up in the mountains here in the Sierra Nevada, and our experience with PFC is what we see a lot is um, we review environmental documents prepared by the Forest Service and BLM, other agencies. And I've been through the PFC training myself, so I've been through the Field training, and um, what what I noticed when I took the field training is that the you know the method is qualitative. The questions might even some of them might even be characterized as subjective. And I was actually when I was looking at the site we went to in the field training, coming up with different answers than some of the full service people who were in the training with me. And one of the, the concerns I have about the PFC method is that the folks doing it, the Forest Service folks doing it, they want a good score so they can do their project or so they can reissue their grazing permit and not have to, you know, change their management or whatever. And it seems like there is some observer bias in the method. And I was wondering um, specifically, does the riparian service team, have they done any testing for observed bias where they let, um, you know, local teams go out and do PFC and then the experts from the national team repeat the method at the same site and see what kind of observer bias we're getting? Is there any kind of publication like that, like quality control? Excellent question. The question of qualitative versus quantitative uh, comes up often. And um, the explanation that we give is that when you go to a doctor, you, you commonly get a qualitative diagnosis. And sometimes they have to uh, take data, take a culture, and send it off to the lab in order to get a more quantitative basis for a diagnosis. But most of the time, they don't need to because they have the expertise to do it. Clearly, their quality of education and experience um, them being journey level and their ability to do that is important to the quality of your diagnosis. And because this is a, a human process done with an interdisciplinary team, the quality of that team does make 
make a difference. They have to know what is in the manuals, and sometimes uh, they, they don't. Um, they have to understand how the concepts fit together, and there is some variation in the quality of their ability to communicate. My um, experience with this is that um, we teach classes the first uh, time or two that people go to a, an area and assess functionality, there tends to be more variation in what they produce because they don't yet understand the concepts and they get clarification. As time goes by, their consistency tends to increase. The tendency for people to want uh, a particular answer uh, sometimes cuts both ways. Sometimes they want an answer that is um, maybe um, a higher level of risk so that they have a greater justification for making the management change that they'd like to make. Sometimes they would like to uh, vindicate the management they've had. Those are human nature tendencies. In order to avoid the problems with those, we continually emphasize that the, um, the manuals that provide the, the science behind each of the Qualitative, the quantitative science behind each of the qualitative assessment attributes and processes list on the check, listed on the checklist is critical. Um, when you use that manual, you'll find that there is very clear indication and guidance for each one of those 17 uh, check questions, and the consistency does get better. I think there has been some um, a kind of testing that you're talking about but I cannot quote the, either the publication or the, um, the data from that. Um, I can't say that from my experience, um, it does depend on the quality of the team, but a good quality team can produce very consistent data. The other thing, though, that I think is even more important than the rating is the standing they get about the system. Some people think that the rating is the end product, and I think that is only a step toward the end product. The end product is the management that it takes to lead us in the right direction. And in order to know what management to apply, getting the story right is critical. Yeah, that your last point is really well taken. I could probably contact the uh, national team and ask them if there's any kind of uh, observer bias um, publications or studies. But I think PFC is great as a communication tool, and it's great for getting people out on the ground to ask those key questions. Where it breaks down for us is that you know, anybody can take a one-day field class and then go out and create these PFC uh, answers, and then they just come to us and they say, well, we have we took the class and we did PFC, and it says it's either static or it's not at risk, so we don't think we need to do anything to make any changes, or, or they'll say things like, they'll jump conclusions, and I, you touched on this in your presentation, that you know, what I taught when I took the class was that PFC is not a sole methodology for assessing the health of riparian systems, and it's not a replacement for biology. But people that we deal with in the Forest Service often jump to, uh, they give us a PFC evaluation, and then they'll say, um, because the PFC is functional or not at risk, um, the system is healthy and there are no water quality issues, and we don't need to monitor. And that's a big jump, a big leap that we're having a real problem with. I think um, if it helps to target those areas where they emphasize water quality uh, measurements, um, that may be quite useful uh, to both your objectives and theirs. Um, if, if there are issues in a place and you believe that the diagnosis, the assessment from uh, proper functioning condition is not accurate, you could bring in the state team or the national team to help um, clarify uh, that one of the roles that we have. And uh, the the other thought that I have with, with uh, is that, as you point out, the other data is still part of the overall program. And my um, understanding of PFC has allowed all of that other data to become actually more useful than it would have been without the PFC assessment. 
because it provides an understanding of what the driving mechanisms are behind the problems that we have in so many places. And uh, um, some people are um, um, much more willing to invest in qualitative data, and uh, they don't like the idea of the qualitative nature of it, and yet what happens to the quantitative data when it goes into a an office, uh, people interpret that quantitative data in a qualitative manner. What is the appropriate standard for that area um, that indeed have the potential and capability to achieve that standard? Is standard high enough for the potential of that area? And um, one of the things I've realized recently is that in many cases, because so much of the water quality issues are driven by functionality issues, we can um, often get to higher water quality by focusing on functionality than we could by simply focusing on standards that are based on statewide or nationwide understandings of minimums. that you mentioned, I assume, is written in a land use plan somewhere. That is not something that is uh, advocated by uh, the national team as an appropriate standard for the nation. Um, my own sense is that there is a certain amount of variation not, not only in how people measure uh, trampling damage, but also in the amount of tramping, trampling damage that a stream can naturally recover from. Trampling uh, can be either a symptom of a much greater problem or a cause of a greater problem. But understanding the role of that trampling in altering that system or in reflecting the altered state of the system is a pretty important thing to do when you think about the management for any particular area. 